meeting, I'd like our clerk to confirm. We have a quorum. I know you did that, Adelia, but if we want to do that again. We have a quorum, uh, Chair Dedina. Great. And then uh, because this is a virtual meeting, I'd like to review the um, process and guidelines uh, for virtual meetings. Uh, just remember that you're not automatically muted uh, by me or the meeting organizers. So you have to mute and unmute yourself. In addition, if you'd like to speak, please turn on your camera or raise your hand by opening the participant panel on the Zoom toolbar and clicking raise hand at the bottom. I think anyone who's managed a Zoom meeting knows it's really hard to manage a meeting and look for the hands raised, participant list. So once again, I'll ask staff uh, to help out with that. I think that's really important. Um, and then once we see you, we can recognize you at the time. But I would definitely like to ask our SENDAG staff to help me with that. I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, and then for members of the public who would like to speak on an item, please use the raise hand icon, icon in the uh, toolbar and then a Zoom toolbar and then SENDAG staff will unmute you. If you're calling in by phone, you need to enter uh, star six to unmute yourself. After your comments, you will be muted by SENDAG staff. If you're calling into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone if you would like to comment on an item and all comments whether emailed or live will be made part of today's meeting record um but i think one thing we've learned as we started opening is meetings in person are much more depth <laughs> it's good that we don't have to drive some of us have to drive to meetings but it's clear that the especially in the border where we need to be with each other and talk talk things out it's really important to do business of government in person so i'm looking forward to getting back to that um and so now we have, uh, moving on to the first item of the agenda, we have public comments. Any comments from the public or members? I can see that Miguel Aguirre has his hand raised and Jason Wells. Good, take it away Miguel and then yeah. Jason. Are you there, Miguel? It, it seems he has he his muted. Sorry about that, you guys. Happy uh, Friday. I'm can you hear me? Speaking, yeah, we can. can Thanks, Miguel. Miguel Laguerre. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Miguel Laguerre with the Border Fusion Group. And uh, we advocate for strategic cross-border districts. As you know, the current crossing paradigm is no longer sustainable. SANDAG's public input period on its draft regional plan is underway and expires August 6. As a binational region, we have a tremendous opportunity to envision a more efficient and effective future. SANDAG is listening and we must speak up. We must start by calling our cross-border mobility dynamic what it is, a binational corridor. California's population has declined two years in a row. San Diego's home prices continue rising with limited affordable housing in sight. And previous county population forecasts of 4.5 million by 2050 have been drastically reduced to 3.7 million. Our regional EDC estimates by the year 2028, our innovation economy will have a shortage of 10,000 workers. And they point out how San Diego may become an unattractive place to live and do business. Big question, where, were, where will all the workers supporting San Diego's economy come from? San Diego must tackle such issues strategically, and that is by nationally. In a fiercely competitive global economy, the U.S. needs Mexico to compete with China, yet here we are stuck at the border with no collective impact economic narrative to lift our region up. Complaining about long border wait times will not solve inherent problems. We must put forth innovative skin in the game projects and solutions in order to bring about economic change. Sandak's plan of hauling workers to crosstown job centers is overlooking these important macroeconomic and competitive trade factors. Bold leadership and transparency, especially for our border communities, traditionally viewed as mere pass-throughs, is needed. Bridge bridging U.S.-Mexico disparities requires an integrated economic design that eliminates crossing stigmas. You know, 
a sense of place, el tercer país, border as destination. We are reaching out for everyone to input more economically through August 6th on SANDAG's plan. Complete mobility corridors implementing such a trans-border view will help ground North America's leading presence in the world. And calling our cross-border dynamic what it is elevates us all into a global trade reality, rich in wonder and fulfilling opportunity. Binational corridors and strategic border districts are the most economically way forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Miguel. I really appreciate it. And uh, we really appreciate all the attention you pay to and really improving the quality of life and transportation options and the economy of the, the binational border region and the immediate border crossing area in San Diego, Tijuana. Um, and now, Jason, take it away. Are you there, Jason? Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Thank you. All right. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Wells. I'm the executive director of the San Isidro Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's been a while since I've spoken to the group, but uh, certainly not due to a lack of interest. Uh, it was actually due to an abundance of confidence in our representation by Council Member Moreno and Chair Dedina. I, uh, I do, however, wish to address uh, recent actions by SANDAG in the name of social equity. I applaud Executive Director Ikrada, staff, and board for certainly talking the talk. This is a region not known for social equity, and it took outstanding leadership to bring the issue to the forefront. However, I plead to this committee, the leadership in making sure SANDAG walks the walk. You uniquely understand access to transportation does not inherently mean equitable access to transportation. From San Isidro on a personal vehicle, a worker could get downtown in 18 minutes, a student to SDSU in 25. Yet mass transit would take at least an hour and 10 minutes to downtown or two hours to San Diego State. God forbid they just waited three hours to cross first. You uniquely understand San Diego County doesn't end at the 905. As SANDAG Vets Mobility Hubs, please do not let everybody get so excited about Santa Fe and an airport link. While that's important to the region, San Isidro is, was, and will continue to be the most utilized. Social equity needs to be applied too to the multi-corridor plan. South Bay makes me think it ends behind Home Depot on, on Hollister. Not only should it be called border to Serrano Valley, but the border region should be an independent segment. I look forward to actual funds being allocated towards social equity and pray the border, the border area gets its equitable share. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate your perspective and all your leadership on, on border issues and, and advocating for social equity and San, the great community of San Isidro. Um, really appreciate it. I was driving around there yesterday and just to see um, the lack of folks, you know, even though things have picked up, definitely there needs to be a lot more commerce. So hopefully that Ped West facility getting open and getting things back going will help a lot. But I know San Isidro has been heavily impacted. So additional questions, comments, member comments or public comments? So no more comments, um, Chair Nadina. Great. Well, hey, thanks. And then I, you know, my doing my monologue about how much I don't like Zoom and how I can't wait to get back in person, I did not acknowledge the fact that we've got an amazing Sandag production team um, that's managed the control, the global control center uh, to make all these meetings possible and, and, to, and to make having us be able to get together virtually from both sides of the border. So, and, and our colleagues in other counties uh, and our tribal partners as well. So I wanna thank them for doing that. That's really, really uh, been important. And we've seen that evolve and become a lot easier since we started this whole thing. <laughs> but also just wanted to acknowledge the great work of the staff and the board in putting forth all the border related issues at, at the Sandag main board meeting, including the border wait time study, the border master plan and the Otay uh, Mesa East port of entry. And I think council member shoes here, but I'm sure he was as pleased as I was, at least I'm sure other members to see the really focus on emissions reductions when it comes to uh, border infrastructure. I was really pleased to see that. It's very important to acknowledge that. And I think we have a big opportunity to really, really discuss how these border investments uh, help reduce emissions and you know improve the economy, right? Like a big win and the quality of life. So I'm uh, very pleased with that. Um, and uh, anyway, um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Hassan. I think he's here today to uh, give his up executive director's report, unless Ray Trainer is going to do that. Yeah, no, I, I am, sir. Uh, good Great, morning. thanks, Hassan. Great to see you. 
Thank you. And and Candle or uh, or Arthur, you're blocking my video, so I I'm not hiding. I just uh, I'm just wanna. Okay, there you are. So uh, Merdidina, uh, thank you, thank you uh, a lot for your leadership, for uh, for your comments at the board meeting today, and thank you for uh, for chairing this group. Uh, committee members, good good afternoon to all of you. I uh, share with you a few things that are important. Uh, one is uh, exciting. Uh, this coming Monday, uh, June 28th, we will be uh, joining Lieutenant Governor Eleni Konalakis, uh, the Secretary uh, of Transportation, David Kim, uh, dignitaries from Mexico, and many uh, partners from our side of the border, where uh, Supervisor Vargas is going to be welcoming all of us uh, to sign a memorandum of understanding with our partners uh, from Mexico. The MOU will recognize an ongoing bi binational partnership and lay the groundwork for continued partnership. Specifically, the MOU will uh, jointly state a goal to open, and this is important, to open the port of entry in late 2024 which means we're gonna to have to start construction sometimes next year. This is significant. This has been in the works for many, many years, as your chair will say, many discussions, uh, a lot of planning, a lot of construction, over half a billion dollar being spent on our side of the border, many trips to Mexico City pre-COVID. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're ready to say, and hopefully our Mexican partners will do the same. We're ready to say, we're ready to build this, this amazing opportunity for both sides of the border. Uh, this significant event will confirm the commitment and strong partnership between the United States and Mexico. I want to express my gratitude to our partners on both sides of the border for making this a reality. I also want to, to mention that this project has recently gained national media attention. Uh, Otay Mesa East Port of Entry was featured in a recent Axios article, it will be featured in a New York Times article soon. This project is an example of how border regions move forward. To that end, I uh, wanna inform you that uh, this week, uh, yesterday I just returned from a trip uh, to Washington DC with uh, my partner from District 11, Gustavo. Uh, we uh, went to the White House and met with uh, uh, National Security Department um, deputy. Uh, we met with customs. Uh, we met the Mexican ambassador uh, to the United States. And I wanna thank uh, Council General Carlos Gonzalez uh, him and I had a brief conversation before I was visit with the, with the Mexican ambassador. And he uh, relayed to us his commitment to make Otay Mesa to at the top of the agenda for the high level economic dialogue that's coming up. We invited, uh, we invited them to make this high level dialogue between two countries to be in our region uh, in, in, uh, in San Diego and offered a tour of the facility. So this committee has been uh, involved in, in this project. I just want you to know, I don't know whether uh, I spoke to Supervisor Vargas, Council Member Marino. To me, the, the border is an important part of our region, not just for the border communities, but for the whole region. The economic future of our region uh, is very linked to Baja California. And so, this border crossings and a lot of work is so needed for the rest of the region to bear the economic benefit. So I am uh, looking forward to Monday's MOU signing and, and to further commitment from our national government to move this further. Another item I want you to know about, and that is we released the regional transportation plan draft. And uh, we released it back in May 28th and we open it for public comments, which will close on August 6th. I encourage you, and I hope you spread the word out. And for 
the public stakeholders, everyone involved, because this is about the future of San Diego. Uh, as I uh, said this morning uh, to the board of directors, I, I think I'd like San Diego to be about accountability, credibility, promises made, promises kept. And, and I'm proud to tell you that this plan truly reimagined the future of transportation in San Diego. Later this year, you're gonna see an amazing project open up and that is the mid coast. San Diego planned it and built it and is gonna turn it over to our sister agency MTS to operate it uh, later uh, this summer. This is a $2.1 billion project uh, on time, on budget. And I can tell you, I've been in this business for 30 years. A project, a project of this magnitude to be on time, on budget is a rarity. And, and I am grateful for the team who delivered it. I'm grateful for you as leaders. And as I said, imagine the possibilities. Imagine if this mid cost, we have two or three in the next couple of decades to connect communities in San Diego. Imagine if we have, and, and when we talk about these lines, eventually they have to connect across the border because it is about linking 7 million people from Baja California and California. And I know it, it, you know, it, it major infrastructure project takes time, takes effort, but our region deserves this. Imagine if we have two or three mid coast in the next few decades. Imagine if the 10,000 connection point that Ray Major talks about are linking our community. Imagine if we have the high occupancy toll facilities connected. Imagine what will this transportation system be? Truly this plan is about reimagining the future transportation system. I, I hope you'll join me in making sure that these are the talking points about the plan. It's not that Sandag is going to spy on you and follow you around and, you know, um, um, going to punish you because you drive. That's not the plan. That's not written anywhere in the plan. Nobody's going to spy on anybody. The plan is about the future. It's about our kids and grandkids. And I hope you'll join me in making sure that when, when you get invited to speak, that will be the talking point. Because I hear some leaders go on TV and say, well, Sandag is going to spy on us. Sandag is going to follow us around. This plan is about providing choices. And, and I think Mayor Didina said it best this morning. You know, this is about connecting communities that otherwise would not be connected. This is about accessing opportunities. So I hope you'll join me in making sure that this plan is truly a blueprint representative and meet all the social equity goals that uh, Council Member Moreno's group talks about. And to the public commenter before, uh, a statement is a statement, but we're gonna follow it by action. And I promise you, we're gonna do our best to be true to what this statement said. Um, last week, um, or actually two days ago, we celebrated the veteran station at the mid coast, one of the nine stations. Uh, I was really pleased and happy to see um, this partnership between Sandbag, uh, Caltrans, MTS, the university, UCSD, the veteran uh, uh, hospital come and, and, and now uh, veterans can access the hospital via transit. And, and as uh, Mayor Gloria and, and Chair Blakespear said it at the opening uh, of that station, that we are a proud military town and we're proud to say that this station is an important landmark as we move forward. Uh, I wanna conclude my report by saying, I wanna thank you because you kept this committee, kept uh, the, the, the pressure going in, in, in dealing with the border issues. Like uh, Chair Didina mentioned, we, we have the studies that says by reducing wait time on the border, we improve air quality, we reduce greenhouse gas emission, and we give access uh, to economic opportunities. So keep the pressure on. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak for, for a few minutes, and I will be happy to answer any questions.
Thanks so much, Hassan. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, are there any questions or comments from members of the public? I don't see any hands raised, Chair Dodina. Great, well, thanks. I do appreciate, I know we all appreciated that amazing uh, discussion of the Midcoast trolley uh, update and it'll be completed. And I, if you didn't, weren't there, I, uh, you know, I talked about having a 64 Volvo that I drove to UCSD uh, from IB back in 1982 when I was a freshman and how hard it was to get there because we all had to live at home. No one had money to go to, to, to live at UCSD, even though it was only $400 a quarter back then. Uh, now it's $14,000 a year for kids to, uh, from South County and all of San Diego to in-state tuition at UCSD. You know, a lot of kids in our communities can't afford to live there and they can't afford to pay those fees either. But tell you what, they can afford to, they will be able to do is afford to get on the trolley and, and get up there. They can study while they're doing it. So uh, really pleased about that project. I, and I, I mentioned it was a gold medal project, a Nobel Prize winning project. It's exactly what government's supposed to do. And, uh, and more importantly, pe people at San Diego and MTS do their jobs really well because uh, it got done under budget and uh, on time. So just fantastic stuff, required intensive coordination. And that's what we're going to be talking about today with the border project. So with that, I will, uh, unless there's any additional comments I'm missing, I will move on to the consent agenda. And we have two things to do. One is approval of meeting minutes. I just want to make sure we done this quickly. And I know Council Member Moreno, you had a question about possibly having a discussion on item number four. So is there a formal like motion that needs to be made on that? Council Member Moreno? Um, I'm happy to make a motion that we discuss item number four, I believe. Uh, okay. I know the presentation would be, um, would be fine with me. I know at city council meetings, I have to get a motion in a second. I, I'm willing to second that, but I'm not sure if we have to do that for Sandag, do we? Uh, Evelia, do we, do we need, or anybody from staff, do we need to vote on that or can we just have a discussion of it? I believe you can have discussion on it. I don't okay. believe there has That's fine. And if you don't mind, Council Member uh, Moreno, we'll, we'll, I'll make a motion. Do we get a motion to actually, if I can ask for a motion to approve the meeting minutes and there are two sets of minutes for approval. I'm happy to make a motion or a second. Great, is there a second? Second. Great, okay. And I don't need to, I just wanna make sure the staff, we don't need to do two different motions. Is that correct? Because there's two sets of minutes. Uh, no, we do not need to make, uh, uh, Chair, this is uh, Peter Stevens, Legal Counsel. Uh, we only need to uh, make one motion since they were um, um, agendized as one item. 10 4. So um, why don't we move on to uh, doing the vote? City of San Diego, Council Member Vivian Moreno. Moreno, yes. County of San Diego. Supervisor Joel Anderson. Anderson, I. <laughs> East County, Council Member Laura Coval. Coval, I. Imperial County, Supervisor Jesus Eduardo Escobar. Escobar, yes. North County Coastal, Supervisor Dave Drucker. Council Member Drucker, yes. My apologies. North County Inland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. South County, Mayor Serge Dedina. Dedina, yes. And the motion passes unanimously with those present. Great, thank you so much. And so now, um, thanks, Councilmember Moreno. We will have, um, I'm assuming, is it Hector or somebody will be providing an update on the uh, results of Mexico's 2021 midterm elections? Hector Vanegas. Uh, as you know, Mexi Mexico held mid election, midterm uh, elections. That's Hector. We, I, I'm, uh, we cannot hear you. I think you need to speak a lot louder or into the okay. mic. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mexico held midterm elections earlier this month on June 6, and these were considered the largest in their history. For the first time, a large number of state elections were aligned with the elections of the lower house of Congress, the federal Congress, known also as Diputados. The country elected 300 federal Diputados, 
which are elected directly, while other 200 are assigned proportionally to the results of the elections based on a list uh, previously submitted by parties. The country also elected 15 governors, 30 of the 30, 32 state legislatures, and about 2,000 municipalities. In general terms, the incumbent party, Morena, was ratified, although it lost seats in Congress. It is still keeping a simple majority, required them to negotiate with a coalition or allied parties in case they want to have a, or need a super majority. Very symbolic was that Morena lost several alcaldías, the former delegations in Mexico City. But on the other hand, President López Obrador party Morena received around 35% of the overall votes, giving his party the control of half of the state governments in Mexico. Also, uh, voting participation was high in midterm elections, reaching about 52% nationwide. In Baja California, participation reached 38%, which is below the national average, but uh, is high for the state, which historically has the lowest voting participation as related to Mexico. Of the 93.5 million people registered in Mexico to vote, almost 3 million are registered in the state of Baja California. Mrs. Marina Avila counted almost half of the votes, 48% of the state, making her the next governor of Baja California for Morena, and she will be the first female governor of the state. Also, our neighbors uh, south of the border elected Mrs. Montserrat Caballero from the same party uh, uh, to be the next mayor of Tijuana. And this concludes my report, Chairman. Thanks so much. Um, questions, comments? Anybody? Councilmember Moreno, have you had a chance to meet with any of the, the new elected officials? No, um, and I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank you, Chair, for allowing us uh, to hear this item. I know it was on consent, and I read it. Um, and I just it's very important, you know. Baja California is our biggest trading partner, and I think it's imperative that we know who um, are the newly uh, elected officials in in our um, border, you know, state, city. Uh, so I, appreci I appreciate you uh, allowing me to hear this. I have not had the pleasure of meeting any of the newly elected officials, but I look forward, hopefully some folks on this board could help us uh, get meetings and, and you know maybe get together sometime during the summer to, to meet everybody, but thank you. No, I, I think that's a super good idea. So I, I was in Ensenada and met um, the recently reelected mayor, I, Armando Ayala Robles, um, who was very, excited to have me down there. And I think very interested in, in crossing the border. I think everybody is. So let's try to figure that out. And, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there. I know we have our Baja or, you know, border summit. I think it's usually in the spring, but I'm forgetting that. Maybe we think about having that in the fall and invite people up for reception. I, I think it's imperative that we continue our cross-border advocacy and face-to-face and -face diplomacy. I think, uh, I think the vaccine diplomacy has been very well received. I think people are very, very uh, grateful, but also, you know, feel like, again, I think that was part of the, the tradition we have of working on both sides of the border. So this stuff's more important than ever. And the role that we all play in, in making our countries uh, get along and be great friends is super important, right? Like really important. So thank you, Council Member Reno. I'll follow up on that and see what we can do. Uh, when the borders open and maybe we have a little reception or we can figure out how to start meetings or something, at least from the borders committee perspective. Yeah, that would be great. I, I would be happy to collaborate with you and Sandag staff and, and help out in that endeavor as a, a borders committee uh, function. And I, one of the things that I forgot to do is um, make a motion that we accept this. Uh, oh, it's a, an information. Well, if yeah. it's a report, I'm happy to make a motion. I think we don't need a motion, but. Um, okay. Chair, quick comment. Yeah. Uh, one of the disappointing aspects of the election, and if it, if it was mentioned, I apologize for repeating this, but uh, Baja California had only 38% voter participation, and it was the lowest participation per capita in the entire uh, country. So that's something that, unfortunately, uh, even though it's a separate country, it is something that, uh, that, that definitely is, is a red flag that comes up that we, we as a collective group, Baja California, did, did not participate fully in these elections. 
That, that's a great point. Yeah, well, I think we all need to do a better job of doing that outreach. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting time to see um, all this, you know, and then to see more mayors get reelected, right? Um, you know, that's that's also new as well. So yeah, but I, I think definitely the work that we have to do is yeah, in terms of the outreach and the personal sort of like local diplomacy is is going to be really important. So um, you know. I wish we could just go down and then we could eat some really good food, um, but uh, maybe we can do both. So I know we all will do, be doing that. So anyway, um, and so now we'll turn it over. Are there any other questions or comments? Great, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, and again, thanks Council Member Moreno and then Hector for the update. Um, and uh, anyway, now we're gonna move on to reports, item number five, and this is a really important project that will be doing some great updates from Mario Orso from Caltrans and Maria Rodriguez from Sandag. Um, and this involves really important collaboration, our neighbors. I just wanna throw it out there that, you know, I've learned a lot from watching how our staff and our Caltrans partners work with their colleagues in Mexico on these very complex infrastructure projects. It's given really great insight into what we need to do to, for water quality and sewage infrastructure. Um, but it's, you know, incredibly complex for all of us that work on the United States side of the border. Just think about all the agencies you have to deal with for any project and then just double that, right? Like, and make it more complex in two languages. Uh, and so, yeah, really impressive work that Mario and Maria and the rest of the SANDAC team have really been carrying out and, uh, and Caltrans team and working with all our partners on both sides of the border to move these projects, to move Otay Mesa East and State Route 11 forward. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Mario and Maria. Okay, sure, thank you, Chair. This is Avelia. We did forget to ask if there was any comments from the public prior to this. I thought I did. I didn't, okay. Were there any comments from the public on number four? We don't have any hands raised, but we just needed to announce it. Thank you. Okay. Great, so can Mario start then? Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna pass it on to Maria and she's gonna carry the torch all day today. And I'll be here on the background in case any questions arise. Great, thank you. Thank you, Maria. So today we're here to give you the latest update and the advancement of the project. Um, we keep working really hard on all of the design, technical, financial aspects. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So we were here a few months ago. Um, we gave a detailed update of the construction. But just to summarize again, we've invested so far $565 million. About 47% is state, 45% is federal, and 8% is local. We used the funds to acquire all of the right away required for the project and for the construction of the roadway elements. So everything on the roadway is either completed or under construction. And right now the team is just focusing on the POE. What do we do on our next steps, our next phase, which is the POE in the commercial vehicle enforcement facility? together with the ITS that is gonna connect all of the ports of entries as a system. So if we go to the next slide. This is a layout of what the port of entry will look like uh, one day, ho hopefully by the end of 2024, that's our goal. We're working really hard on the concept on all of the requirements with CBP and we're going to make this port the most efficient, secure, innovative port of entry. Some of the innovations are the interchangeable lanes that will manage the peak traffic throughout the day. So we'll be able to process either passenger vehicles or commercial vehicles and assigning more lanes depending on the demand throughout the day. Other elements for ITS are the advanced travel information system that will be provided on all of the roadways approaching the ports of entry. We'll be able to know the wait times in real time. Uh, we'll be able to disseminate information about the ports and other information that is useful for both the agencies working on these facilities and also for the traveling pass, the traveling uh, vehicles, personal vehicles and goods. So, 
what are we focusing on right now? We can see on the next slide. We started the utility relocation on the site of the POE. We're working on securing a consultant for the design of the facility. But the major areas we really need everybody to focus on are the agreements that are needed so that we can finance the project. Here we're highlighting some of the agreements. Uh, the first one is the MOU we will be signing on Monday. As Hassan was explaining, it's a really important MOU to move this project forward with Mexico. There is another one that will come up really soon is the staffing agreement with CBP on them staffing the facility the day we open for traffic. The other element is the ownership, uh, how we will pass that ownership of the POE after we build it, whether we pass it to the federal government or we do a lease with the federal government. Then there will be a revenue split agreement with Mexico and the trustee determination. So the entity that will split the, the revenues and send them to Mexico and to the US um, in which manner. On the financial side, um, Andre Dujan, the chief financial officer, is leading the effort on developing a financial strategy. So what we foresee at the moment is going to be a mix of funds, TIFIA and bonding, bonding supported by the future revenues that will be collected on SO11. We're also applying for uh, grants. Uh, one of them is Infra. We're waiting to hear back from Infra. And we're working with the federal and state agencies on this staffing budget. If we go to the next slide. So Hassan totally stole my thunder today, but we wanted to announce the importance of the MOU on Monday. On Monday, we'll get together and this agreement has very important technical elements. One is that one single tow location on the US side. So both northbound and southbound traffic will be collected on SO11. It states that we will develop a toll sharing agreement on how those revenues get split between the two countries. We'll have Miro ITS functionality. So it needs to work as one system across the border. Uh, it states how we were gonna find, fund the projects. So on the US side, we have paid with um, local, federal, and state funds, so public funds, the right-of-way and the roadway. And we plan to finance with the total revenue the last piece, which is the port of entry and the CBF. On the Mexico side, they plan to fund with public funds the, sorry, one back. With the public funds, we'll cover the right-of-way and the port of entry, and they'll finance the uh, roadway with the revenues. So on Monday, we'll have US representatives, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis will be signing with um, Secretary Kim, Chair uh, Blexter, and Todd Gloria will be signing. On the Mexico side, unfortunately, the, the first person here listed won't be able to attend, so it won't be signing the agreement. But from SCT, we'll have Rogelio Rivero, Director of Road Development. From SRE, we'll have the General Director for North America, Roberto Velasco. And from SAT, we'll have Horacio Durarte, General Administration of Mexican Customs. On the next slide, we just want to give you an overview of all of the activities. I mentioned we're working on the design, we're working on utility relocation and site pre uh, preparation. And we're working on one of the most important studies right now is the investment grade traffic and revenue study. This study is gonna tell us how much we're gonna be able to collect in revenues and the traffic we're gonna be uh, getting at Otemisa East so we can better plan the facilities. As part of the study, we just finished a survey, a cross-border survey, and today I have invited our consultants from CDM Smith to talk about the preliminary results that we got from the survey. So before I pass it on to Yagnesh, I just want to mention we're working really hard 
to finish the project and open to traffic by September 24. And we're here for any questions after Yakna's presentation. Next slide. Take it away. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Yagnash Jamarwala, CDM Smith, Traffic and Revenue Consultant for Sandag. Um, as Maria mentioned that we are doing an investment grade traffic and revenue study. Um, what this study will do is estimate the traffic and toll revenue that will be generated at Ota Mesa East Port of Entry. And this study will be used to support the financing of the project. As part of the study, we undertake stated preference travel survey. So what are stated preference travel survey? The purpose of the stated preference travel survey is to obtain detailed information that could be used to determine how sensitive travelers would be to the toll rates and travel time savings for this new port of entry. This survey is used to determine what will be the willingness of the pay of the travelers for the toll crossing. So as part of the study, we undertook a 2021 stated preference survey this survey was conducted for passenger vehicles as well as commercial vehicles. The passenger vehicle survey was done in the field, online through social media outreach and direct email invitation over the last two months. Commercial vehicle surveys were conducted by sending out email invitation and phone interviews. I would like to take a portion to thank Sendex communication team, including Southwest Strategy and Applied Research Team for their assistance in successful implementation of this survey. The stated preference survey presented hypothetical trade-off questions with combination of wait time and toll rates. For example, on the right, you can see uh, that if San Isidro General Lane, if the wait time was one hour and the new Otay Mesa East Crossing would offer a wait time of 25 minutes, would the survey respond and willing to pay a toll cost of $16? This is just an example. Similar, similar questions were asked, and this will be used to derive the willingness to pay of the respondents that will be used as part of the traffic and revenue study. Next slide. So as we do the survey, what is important is to getting the right sample. Um, so we had about 36, uh, 3,634 survey completed for passenger vehicles. Of these total surveys, about 1,889 were completed in person and 1,745 were completed using online web survey. There's, there's two graphs here, the one in the center of the slide, it shows the distribution of the survey respondents by their country of residence. So we had about 40% of the responses by the residents of Mexico and about 60% by the residents of United States. The graph on the right uh, shows weekday and weekend share by country of residence. We wanted to make sure that our survey included travelers for both weekday and weekend. The US residents, about 50% of the trips were reported on a weekday and 46% on the weekend. For the residents of Mexico, 73% of the trips reported on a weekday and 27% on the weekend. This is reflective of the travel restrictions that are currently in place. Now I'll ask my colleague, Dan Beggard, who's our stated preference survey to share some interesting statistics and draft findings from this survey. Dan. Thanks, Yagnish. Um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide to the next one. Yeah. Um, so to uh, continue what Yagnish was saying about um, the distribution and the, um, and the effects of the limitations, uh, the travel restrictions. We've got two graphs here showing uh, on top the residents of the United States and their different trip purposes that they stated while taking the survey. And on the bottom, uh, residents of Mexico. And the light blue bars are showing data from the 2019 survey of passenger vehicles that was conducted pre-COVID. And the dark blue bars are this state of preference survey uh, conducted in the spring. And you can see, um, directing your attention to the Mexico chart first, um, that, that in pre-COVID conditions, the uh, shopping trips were the highest share of, of all trips with 52% uh, 
uh, is what we found from that survey. And work trips were 31%. But now our current survey with the travel restrictions in place, uh, we see that that uh, essential work is the, the highest trip purpose share with 72%. And um, the rest of the categories are below 10% or at or below 10%. And with the United States, there was less of a change, less of an adjustment from the, the uh, travel restrictions. But you can see that uh, social trips declined slightly from 54% to 39%. And, um, and they were dispersed through some, some other trip types, but um, not as much of a drastic change as we saw among residents of Mexico. Next slide, yeah, thank you. And this uh, slide here gets at um, our efforts to achieve a representative sample of border crossers. So trying to reach um, the uh, people who make the types of trips that are, are reflect, reflected in actuality. And we had some data from 2019 about um, among people who crossed at either Otay Mesa or San Isidro, um, their splits, the breakdown between the two ports of entry. And in 2019, that was 29% of people crossing at Otay and 71% at San Isidro. And what we saw in our survey was 27% uh, of people describing a, a trip using Otay Mesa and 73% at San Isidro. So rather close there and a good uh, representative sample. And then the chart below here just further breaks that out by lane type at each of the two um, facilities. So the Otay Mesa is on the left, the, those three sets of bars, the general lane, ready lane, and sentry lane. And then San Isidro is on the right uh, with general ready and sentry as well. And then again, a good representative sample. On this slide here, um, we uh, gathered a data point on people's self-reported wait time. Um, so what you're seeing here is the, the average expected wait time from someone who's either interviewed in person or who took the survey online and uh, reported how much wait time that they recalled experiencing. And um, Again, we see the Otay Mesa um, uh, lane types on the left and San Isidro on the right. And you can see that uh, the sentry lanes had uh, self-reported wait times close to a half an hour, whereas the general and ready lanes were um, approaching two hours or more. And, and one thing you'll notice is the, the ready lane at Otay Mesa is higher than the general lane. and um, we would expect the average wait time at the ready lane to be lower than the general lane, but um, I, the, uh, the average that we observed is an effect of having a small, relatively small sample size or comparatively small sample size of the Otay Mesa general lane uh, compared to the ready lane and, and the other uh, crossing types. So um, it's uh, important to keep in mind that this is uh, just, um, it's not an accurate reflection necessarily of the wait times at the border. It's just what people perceive their wait times were. And this slide here is um, um, describing the results of the trade-off questions that Yagnesh described on the first slide where someone would be presented with a hypothetical toll cost and hypothetical time savings at either Otay Mesa East or an alternative crossing. And um, we've split it here into two groups of um, high wait times, we're calling the peak uh, crossing group who had uh, self-reported wait times of greater than 90 minutes and then the off peak who had less than 90 minutes. And uh, you see that uh, among the, the peak group with the high wait times, they chose the uh, Otay Mesa East 54% of the time and the off-peak uh, travelers chose 39% of the time. So um, a good proportion, a good portion of 
of crossers shows regardless of, of their expected wait time, but um, the higher the wait time, the more likely they were to, to choose Otay Mesa East. This slide is showing uh, that same data, except uh, breaking it out by the uh, hypothetical toll costs that were presented. So if you'll see on the bottom of the graph there, we've got $5 or less, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and then up to $25. And the two lines, again, correspond to the, um, the peak crossers who had higher expected wait times and therefore were shown um, higher toll costs, uh, hypothetical toll costs. And then the light blue line is the, the off-peak travelers with the, the lower wait times. And the important takeaway from this slide is that, um, that as you'd expect, the proportion of people choosing the uh, Otay Mesa East decreased with, with increasing toll costs, but that there continued to be some demand, um, some willingness to pay even at the higher uh, toll costs. So, so for the, uh, the peak crossers at a toll cost of, of less than $10, they were at 67% um, choosing the uh, OME and um, even up to $25, they were still 39% uh, choosing Ote Mesa East. And with uh, the off peak, uh, it was 53% uh, down to, to 20%. So, so um, Again, as, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, more likely to choose with the higher wait time, but still some propensity to choose even with the, uh, the lower wait times. Daniel, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Do you mind going through commercial really quick, the highlight? Sure. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, jump ahead. Uh, so for the commercial survey, we interviewed um, companies rather than individual truck drivers. So trying to get to the decision makers, the logistics or managers, and um, and got a good sample there as well. Again, thanks to the Sandag staff and our sub consultants for, for really pushing the survey out and, and getting good responses there and uh, good distribution of firm types and, and firm locations in the United States and Mexico and, uh, and uh, the different firm types there. And this graph is just like the one previously prevented presented for the uh, passenger vehicles. Um, again, with uh, the peak crossers with uh, trucks expecting a wait of 90 minutes or more and those uh, in the off peak expecting less than 90 minutes. Um, an even greater propensity to choose the Otay Mesa East among the peak truck crossers, 67% uh, versus I think it was 52 or 3% for passenger vehicles. And then uh, in the off peak, uh, still some some um, truckers um, choosing the uh, the Otay Mesa East, but um, but uh, not nearly as much as uh, the the peak crossers. And again, this this uh, line graph showing them split out by the hypothetical toll costs that they were presented. So among the peak um, crossers. 80% chose to uh, use Otay Mesa East at the $20 to $29 level, and still at the uh, above $40, 53% were continuing to choose that option. And um, in the off peak, there's a big drop off after um, above $30, where and no one chose the Otay Mesa there, but but under $30. Um, 33% uh, and, and under $20, 51%. So definitely. Thank you, Daniel. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, sure. we ran out of time. But the no takeaway problem. here is that there is a willingness to um, to pay for Otay Mesa East. The numbers you saw are not, it's not what it's going to be. The toll rates we're going to be applying, that's the willingness to pay. The ranges for the toll might be different and probably lower than the numbers you saw here. So please don't take those numbers and run with it. It's just part of the process. Uh, so we learn more about the willingness to pay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for giving us a chance to give an update.
Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, everybody, Daniel. Um, really interesting. Um, any additional comments, Mario, uh, at all, or Rob, conclude? No, just, you know, I think just to see how the, the sausage is made, right? And, and, and looking on the tolls and, and, and uh, how we start deriving to, like Maria said, they're not what they're going to be considered, but it starts taking the state of preferences. So, it's a very complex project. Um, and this is just one of the little minor pieces, but very important. And we just wanted to show you what, what what's in the sausage factory going on. Okay, okay. Uh, really good. Um, um, uh, any questions, comments from public or members? I don't see any hands raised, Chair Dadina. Well, I'm going to throw out my emissions thing because I always think it's interesting. Oh. I was taught in my professional life, I had this conversation about ship traffic and then correlating that with emissions reductions and trying to quantify like, well, how many, you know, offsets to, you know, carbon credits do you buy. But I, I think you could also correlate time reduction, you know, like people choosing to cross the border and then additional minutes spent crossing the border and how much more emissions are, you know, emitted, like, Anyway, there's got to be, I'm not a, a mathematician or a, a scientist, but there's definitely got to be a correlation between that. That could be a positive one in terms of identifying like the perfect number, not only reduces wait time, but it has this much impact in reducing emissions, right? Like that's actually, that's actually pretty interesting. More importantly, it saves those guys in truck traffic, you know, an average, what, how do you monetize every minute spent in traffic? I'm sure those guys do. They know what exactly their trip costs. So they, they have that the Dina, monetizing it. So. Devedi, I'm sorry. We do have um, council member Laura Covell that would like to um, make a comment. Good. Um, go ahead. But anyway, I think there's some a lot of additional numbers we can we can we can run. We can run the eigenvectors and and do the data the data crunching and the sausage making to to really show why this is important and how that that perfect number will make a big difference. Go ahead, council member. Yeah. Thank you. And. Um, I'll kick off by thanking Jack Shu for filling in for me while I was out recovering for, from surgery. I appreciate that. Uh, really excited to see the OTI plan. Looks great. And, um, you know, I've been on the East County Economic D Development Council for many years before joining this committee. And this transportation corridor is very important to us as well in East County. Um, there are definitely impacts as you travel up the 125 and into the 52. So I just want to make sure that when we're talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're also talking about the bottleneck next to the Sycamore landfill on the 52 freeway. Because if you haven't traveled that route before, this is where the trucks get held up in East County. Um, it's, a, it's a steep incline and the, the, the lanes narrow. And uh, being right next to the Sycamore landfill, uh, we've got not only the trash trucks going out in the morning, but then we'll have the Otay Mesa traffic as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Can I comment on that uh, and on your comments, uh, Chair? Um, going to your comments on, on looking for the sweet spot, uh, this facility, it's, the studies are looking to balance how much we can benefit the majority of the people Without going in and uh, in, in, in having a super high toll, so it's right. it's it's finding that balance. Uh, if if we really wanted to make a facility that was going to make a lot of money, we would propose the smallest facility possible because there's a willingness to pay, and and it would cost less. So finding that balance between providing as much service to the public, and also providing some. Uh, uh, an acceptable rate that it's just for the public, the environmental justice piece. Now, what you just mentioned about finding that sweet spot about emissions, our models are showing us that a capture rate of passenger vehicles between 12 and 17% of the universe of the, of the crossings in between San Diego and Tijuana for passenger vehicles, and about 25 to 30% of the truck crossings that we would be capturing this new facility would help reduce emissions up to 50% at peak hours at existing Otay and San Isidro. So we are doing those modeling to see the, the, the finding the sweet spot of how we can benefit the most, 
but at the same time, make it an affordable crossing and manage the congestion through pricing. Regarding the, the, the excess traffic or possible additional traffic um, on the 125, our studies have showed that do what the council member just mentioned, due to the, 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 the grades in that area, as well as the added distance, it's going to be unlikely that trucks are going to want to take the 125 for a long haul, only if they're thinking to going to the Imperial County, but it's highly unlikely that they would use the 125-52 route to go to the Inland Empire or, or the LA area. So we've been looking and tracking that for a while, and that's what our studies have uh, shown to us. So I just wanted to address the comments and the questions. Great, thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments? A anyway, I think, I, I think Mario, you guys did a great job on, I think the emissions reduction, but also the job loss studies that Sandag did in terms of identifying the jobs lost from border crossing. And you can even play out the emissions reduction into, and Council Member Moreno, I think you'll appreciate this too, looking at potential reduction in asthma cases and childhood, you know, air, you know, you know, whatever kids getting sick. I mean, there's so many positive correlations that you can play out with 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 reduced wait times, right? That that have this number, this quotient that I think is going to be really powerful, right? That to also highlight the importance of infrastructure and infrastructure investment, not just whether it's on the border, but anywhere. So it's really, really good stuff. I, I really appreciate it. And I think there's some more we can quantify this and to show the positive correlation in what we're doing just makes our case more powerful across all these different ranges, whether it's employment, public health, um, and obviously you know, economic benefit and emissions reduction. So great stuff. Um, any additional questions or comments? Good, okay, well, we'll move no on to- No hands raised for the public comments. Um... Dina. Your comments? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. There are no public comments um, for the record. Great. Okay. Awesome. And then we'll move on to item number six. Um, that's South Bay to Serrano Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan with Jennifer Williamson from Sandag. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Williamson. And I'm the Transit Planning Program Manager here at Sandeg, and I'm the Project Manager for the South Bay to Sorrento Multimodal Corridor Plan. Today I'm going to give you an update on the plan, the public input, and everything that we've been doing to date so far. Um, I also want to give you an update on some of the projects that are rising to the top as priority projects. And if I can just take a minute to reply to Mr. Wells, we are working on changing the name and rebranding the study to better reflect the border. Next slide, please. And again, the next slide, please. So what is a, a CMCP? We like to call these comprehensive multimodal corridor plans a CMCP. And what they are really meant to do is to create corridor families of projects. That seems a little weird, but essentially what we want to do is ensure that we're not creating individual projects in silos. So every corridor gets identified with a wide range of multimodal opportunities for travel. And we like to think of these CMCPs as a bridge between the existing regional plan, basically you know, 30 to 50 years in the future, the CMCPs are gonna look at much nearer term projects. So really between about five and 15 years and seek to build those projects that get us the biggest bang for the buck in that time frame. Also, the SB1 pro funding programs really require that a CMCP be done in order to be competitive for these projects. So they're kind of multi-layered, but really the bottom line is that if we want to be competitive for funding, we need to complete these CMCPs and we need to maximize our multimodal corridor opportunities. Next slide, please. And I'm going to skip to the next slide in order to save some time here. So there's currently about five CMCPs underway in our region, and I'm not gonna go through all of them. The one that we're here to talk about today is our South Bay to Sorrento corridor, which is shown in the purple. And the reason I chose purple for this project is that that corridor is gonna be the future home for the purple line. 
Um, it's a very large corridor, if you will, 31 miles. And if we go to the next slide, I will tell you, these are some future projects that we have, but the next slide is going to show you how we've broken out the study into sub areas. And the reason that we've identified these seven sub areas is that really these this corridor is so big that each of these sub areas has different types of trips and different travel needs. So if you're at the border, you may have a different travel need than somebody up in Mission Valley or somebody in Kearney Mesa. We know that Coronado has a very big correlation to South County. And so those trips between those areas are really important. So breaking it into different sub areas really helps us to further identify what types of projects can advance better trip making in this study area. So we currently have a project team defined in our study area that's made up of Sandeg, Caltrans, City of San Diego, Chula Vista, Imperial Beach, Coronado, National City, and the military. And we've also been reaching out to our project partners in Mexico. And in fact, last week, I think it was last week, I lose track of time now, um, Colleen and Hassan and Hector met with the mayor of Tijuana and gave her a briefing on the project. And, you know, part of what they talked about really was this, this study and how we can help facilitate some of these near term projects to begin implementation. Next slide, please. And next slide. So in order to understand what types of projects we want to do, we, we do very similar to what you've seen with the regional plan, and that is break out our study and to understand the populations within it. And, and really, social equity is a huge component of what we're looking at. We're trying to advance projects that meet the needs of our social equity populations. And we've looked at communities, the senior population within our corridor, and you'll see our corridor outlined in the black there, our minority populations, and then low income households in the area. And so um, what we wanna do here is really look at how we can connect these folks to jobs, but then also we're looking at how we can connect them to educational opportunities, to activity centers, to shopping, to hospitals, and you know, just activity centers, if you will. How are we best gonna get these folks to where they need to go? Next slide, please. So we looked at our low income populations and here you'll see that we have, um, it looks very similar. What you're seeing on the left is 2016 today. And then what you see on the right is 2035. And unless you're looking really, really, really close, you're not gonna see a whole lot of difference. And really that's because there isn't a lot of change in this category. In fact, we see a slight reduction um, of the number of low-income residents in our study area. And that could be reflective of displacement or moving outside of the uh, corridor. But essentially what we do know here is that the areas where low-income residents are living aren't changing. They're gonna be in south of the eight in large concentrations in the middle part and the southern part of our corridor. Next slide, please. So this slide illustrates kind of the same thing, our, our minority populations. And we do see substantial or more substantial, I shouldn't say substantial, more substantial um, increases in the number of minority residents here. And most of the increases are growing in areas where the communities have done community plan updates. So we see increases in Sorrento Valley, we see it in Mira Mesa, Kearney Mesa, and then Mission Valley. And we know that the city of San Diego has worked really hard on community plan updates and densifying those areas. So we're seeing the growth in those areas. Next slide, please. This final slide that looks at our social equity populations are senior residents. And here we see huge, huge increases in the numbers um, of seniors in our study area. And this is just reflective of the graying of San Diego, if you will. We know that that San Diego, Ray Major, our economist likes to say that, you know, San Diego is going to look a lot like Florida at some point in the future. And this slide really helps to illustrate that that is true. And what it helps us to do, though, is develop projects that are um, effective for seniors. They, they have different travel needs than um, other folks within this region. So next slide, please. And next slide. 
So what I want to do here is talk to you a little bit about the priority projects in our region. This is our transit leap initial network. And probably what I want to show you here, not probably what I do want to show you here, is that the CMCP has allowed us to take a further refined look at what the regional plan network has done. So we have a purple line corridor that is of, of great interest to a lot of folks um, in the border area as well as in the South County. We had two alignments that we were looking at, one that went to North Park and then one that went to City Heights. Through additional data analytics, we were able to establish that alignment that went through City Heights and served the new university, SDSU West, was gonna be a preferred alignment. So this is just to give you a flavor of what the CMCP can do. Next slide, please. This is a slide that shows the mobility hubs and really the focus of our, our mobility hub in this area is really gonna be on those uh, South County mobility hubs, but probably our biggest focus is gonna be on that one in uh, Mexico, or I'm sorry, in, Tio, in the border area, because we are gonna be embarking on a, a border study um, at Sandeg here very quickly, but as part of our outreach that we've done, and I'll talk about that in a minute, what we've learned is that people really do want to connect from one border crossing to another to the communities in South County and transit's not always the best option for that. So the mobility hub is gonna be a good answer and a good uh, provide us with some good solutions on how to connect those folks. Next slide, please. And I just talked to you a little bit about that. So let's go to the next slide. The other um, priority projects that have been identified through our outreach that are really important for, for people or for connections is this one that you see at the lower southern end of your map here. And it's the light blue line and that's our rapid route 50 and MTS is working on that route right now. And this is really to provide a much quicker crossing from Otay Mesa over to connect to the trolley and then ultimately to connect into Imperial Beach. We know that this is gonna be a gangbuster line because the Route 905, which currently does this in a much slower manner is uh, standing room capacity today. So people are very eager to see this route come online and this is one of our highest priorities. Next slide, please. This is our rapid Route 60 and you see this route operating from the border, the light blue line, all the way up to our future central mobility hub. This route is really getting some attention from our outreach because people are looking for a faster solution in the near term for the Blue Line Express that you may have heard about. And really what they wanna do is get from the border up to Northern Connections as quick as possible. So the Rapid 640 really looks to, you know, hit about three or four stations in South County to connect you very quickly up to downtown San Diego or up to the central mobility hub where you'll be able to access a wide range of um, you know, activity centers and other connecting transit routes. So next route, please. And just a minute, before I jump into the goods movement, I did want to mention that even though we don't have a map for it, one of the other key projects that's really just, I would say in the last two or three weeks has been identified as a significant project that they would like our corridor to focus on is improvements to the existing blue line. And so that has risen to a high level of priority and we'll be looking at, you know, how could we maximize and potentially do a, a blue line express? So um, our CMCP will be evaluating that also. And that's very representative of what we're hearing today with our um, regional plan uh, projects. So now we have our goods movement projects. And I know this group is, is very interested in this. Our, our study has identified over 45 new projects to help facilitate goods movement um, at the border crossing. So next slide, please. So we have um, that, that last slide that you saw there was the Otay Mesa East point of entry slide. And really the important thing there is that you heard from Mario, this is one of Sandex's five priority projects it's gonna provide security, it's gonna provide safety and improve the economy, foster some innovative technical solutions, but also it's going to help us identify some additional multimodal solutions that we can layer in on top of that uh, new point of entry and, and really kind of maximize the mobility in this region. 
So, and then this, this slide here, and I apologize, I, I did have some better graphics, but this is our commercial vehicle enforcement area. And this project would align with the improvements that GSA is currently making at Otay Mesa and um, really help to, to provide a better connection between what GSA is doing and then what Caltrans is doing also. So next slide, please. And this is one of the pilot programs that's currently being discussed. And we aren't sure if this is gonna move forward, but it has been identified um, in the list as, as a potential pilot project, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So what have we been hearing? And, and you know, as part of our outreach that we've been doing, um, the CMCP requires that we do extensive outreach. So we created quite an extensive map and, and um, social media outreach campaign. And this map that you see on this slide is called Social Pinpoint. And it's about the easiest tool I think we've ever used at Sandag because all you do in is, is you go into the, the site, the website, you're able to grab a little icon that tells you, you know, are you interested in transit, truck, truck movements, goods movement, uh, freeways, what exactly are you interested in? You grab the icon and you put it on the map in the area where your concern is, and you can leave a comment. So that's pretty fantastic because what that allowed us to do is to go out and, and have people give us their comments in a more meaningful way than just commenting on a spreadsheet. What we heard, and we've gotten close to 300 comments, and, and that's really great because if we put this out, in regular format in the past, we would hope to get maybe 50 comments. So we're pretty happy with what this, what we're hearing this. You know, what we've heard is that people are concerned about air quality out at the border. They're concerned about the lack of um, active transportation connections. And then, as I said before, you know, goods movement, that's a prime um, point of interest for everybody in our border region. So this is all very consistent with what we've heard, but we've also heard about some specific things like where there's missing sidewalks, where there's not a good transit connection, where we're not having a fast enough transit connections, and then also where there's uh, breakdowns in the arterial and freeway network. So next slide, please. And next slide. So where are we at? Um, this, is a, this is a big study, 31 miles, seven subregions. We are looking to have this done in the fall of 2021. And I'm gonna share with you right now that I don't think we're gonna make that. We're probably gonna to have to push it a little bit because it's such a big study area that we really wanna make sure we get all of that engagement and we understand all of those comments that people are giving us. And so we're still in what you see that purple kind of arrow in the center there in our transportation solution assessment. And essentially that means that we're gathering all of our input. and. Today, we've identified over 340 different types of projects for this 31 mile corridor. So now we're gonna to have to synthesize these together to create multimodal travel options. And it's, it's fairly complicated. So that's what we'll be doing in the summer. We'll be coming back to this group as well as the transportation committee in the fall to talk to you about what the um, alternatives look like which projects make the cut, which projects have the greatest likelihood of serving um, our social equity populations, which, which projects have the like, highest likelihood of getting funding through SB1 programs, because ultimately that's what we wanna do. We wanna make sure that we move these projects forward to get, to get funding. So next slide, please. We have a million and one ways to stay engaged on this project. And this is my call to action to you, if you will. We are currently taking more comments. You can go in and one of these links here and put your own pin on the map with one of the comments. You can also download our strategies, the 300 plus strategies, but they're all broken out by sub area and then by a service type. So if you're interested in seeing, you know, what kind of transit projects are in there, it's pretty easy to go in and see what types of transit projects and, and see if we're missing anything. I mean, really, that's what we want to know. Are we missing anything? Is there anything more out there that we, we should be looking at? So we have this fully translated into Spanish, our, our spreadsheets, as well as the actual tool, as well as the social pinpoint site. So 
you know, being aware that we are a border community, we really do want to ensure that we have a full cadre of um, ways to get involved with this project. So next slide, please. And I think I told you this, we are, you know, doing our outreach right now. And we're also kind of trying to take this a step forward. So we've done two stakeholder meetings and one major public meeting where we had, you know, close to 150 people attend virtually. But we want to take this a step further. This is a big, big study area. So we're offering uh, office hours. And so staff, that would be me and my assistant, we put ourselves out there and we offer half an hour to meet with whoever wants to. Our, our council member, Bill Sankey, actually is going to come to an office hours. And we're going to walk you through whatever your interests are. And if you don't see a project, you know, we want to understand better how we can integrate that project into our study area. So on that website I just showed you, you can sign up for our office hours. We're also available because, you know, big corridor to go out there and do a bunch of presentations. And we have been doing that because these, you know, it's a big corridor again, and we're just, we just don't want people to get lost. So every which way you want to be communicated with, I think we've, we've tried to tackle them all. And next slide. And here's a, a more colorful way to show just how uh, much outreach we're doing. The pink on this, in case you want to go back and, and hit it, is the one that will take you directly to our maps and our tools. And, you know, it is pretty fun, I will say, to go and drop your, your little icons in there and give us your comments. We've tried to make it very easy. So I tried to go very quickly because I know you're a little bit behind schedule. I think the next time I come to you in the fall, it'll be much more project specific and you'll begin to see how we've melded these projects into multimodal corridor alternatives. So with that, I am free to, free to answer questions. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate all the work you're doing, especially really innovative. Um, office hours are great. I really like that. And I think the new tools you guys are using is, you know, I've just seen a lot of evolution on trying to figure out how to reach the, the public effectively. So it sounds like you're doing that. Um, so with that, if you don't mind, guys, I, I'll open up the public comment first, just to make sure we get that out of the way. Um, is there any, and then number of comments, are there any public comments or questions? There are no public comments at this moment for the record. Good, and then we can we can do member comments, but come back, Jennifer, if we have any additional public comments. Yeah. Uh, any uh, member comments? Sure, if I may, this is Vivian. Go, go ahead. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you to staff for the presentation. And I really want to start by acknowledging Sandag for all their work on the South Bay to Sorrento comprehensive multimodal corridor plan. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I understand I understand the importance of this corridor plan for the SB1 funding and for the data we're gathering, which is truly vital. Uh, but as we move forward with the corridor plan, I want to ensure that we understand the importance of the border region and importantly, including the blue line and most importantly, the San Ysidro Intermodal Transit Center. Um, I, it was shocking to me to see that the San Ysidro ITC was not mentioned in the corridor plan. Um, as has been mentioned in this body, uh, the San Ysidro Port of Entry is the busiest land border crossing in the world. And I think we need to realize that San Ysidro is one of the cornerstones of our transportation network and one of the biggest mobility hubs that is active right now even with minimal investment. Uh, 13,325 people board the trolley in San Ysidro every single day. The second biggest station or busiest station is 12th and Imperial with 6,725 boardings, which is about half of San Ysidro's passenger volume. Uh, with ridership, um, you know, obviously we're in COVID right now, but uh, you know, with, with ridership this high right now, um, our busiest land border crossing um, is San Isidro, is this border, right? And, and my gut tells me that it's, it's gonna get even busier. So this is making the San Isidro ITC just even more vital. Um, I, I looked into the mission statement of Sandag Forward Regional Plan, and, and it's to provide a fast, fair, and clean transportation system and a resilient region. And I don't think we could have this mission become reality unless the San Isidro ITC is a cornerstone project 
uh, the, the traffic coming in through San Isidro port of entry doesn't just stop in San Isidro. It keeps on going on the I-5, on the 805, and all over the nation. Um, public outreach is also very, very important and very vital. Um, and, and I do commend uh, the public outreach uh, you guys are doing. And, and I thank you for responding to my staff. We had a, quite a few questions about uh, the outreach. So kudos to you guys. I would love to partner up uh, to do a, a virtual, as we're, we all, we're all virtual right now, um, meeting to get some of the residents in District 8 um, to, to opine and, and to give their input on this. Uh, and you know, I, the data we're gathering right now is so important for future planning. I've seen it at the city of San Diego with the VMTs and the data that SANDAG had, um, and, and in that case didn't have. So it's imperative that we get it right. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that there is good participation. And my understanding that this study is only halfway through. Uh, so I, I do look forward to working with, with you guys and my colleagues, and I look forward to welcoming, welcoming you guys back to this committee uh, you know, as long as the chair, uh, with the chair's permission, to see what the update uh, is in the next few months. So thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this presentation. No, that's the great, actually great idea. Um, perfect. Um, additional qu uh, questions or comments from members or the public? There are no public comments for the record. Great. Any additional member comments at all? I'm, I'm missing anybody. Well, thanks. You know, Jennifer, we've got some really enthusiastic border uh, constituents here that are really excited about everything that you're doing. And I think they want to, the reality Regina, is- Regina, there yes. is a hand raised. Uh, well, then I will Martina. stop talking and turn it over to our, who's, uh, I can't, who has the hand raised? Cesar Martinez has his hand raised. Go ahead. Hello, Jennifer. Eh, bueno, voy a hacer la, la pregunta en español más fácil. Eh, comentabas acerca de, de la invitación que hicieron a la, alcalde, a la alcaldesa para compartir toda esta información. Eh, de, manera, de manera solamente curiosidad y, y soy eh, de parte de la, de la Alianza de la, para la Movilidad Activa de Tijuana. Este, ¿Qué respuesta ha habido de la, de la alcaldesa? o de las autoridades en general de este lado para, para eh, eh, dar respuesta, unifi eh, unificarnos en, en, de, de la manera de nuestra capacidad a, a todos los proyectos que, que ustedes tienen, que son impresionantes y grandiosos. Uh, gracias, César. Este, I'm not sure who's going to answer that question. Jennifer, you the translation, or Hector, uh, the question already understands. What was your response from the, uh, the mayoral act? Um, to this presentation, just so that they can, uh, the mobility sort of coalition can can work more closely. Um, anybody want to answer that, or I can try to help. Uh, okay. uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we had a meeting with the mayor of Tijuana, Carla Ruiz. Uh, oh, okay. Weeks ago, and in fact, it was uh, with the purpose of presenting her the transformative vision that. San Diego region is working on that includes a lot of the border features uh, because it is our intention that our vision also has a, a replication on south of the border. And, and as I mentioned previously, uh, Mayor Ruiz is staying only a few months more. She's very enthusiastic and she said she was uh, uh, willing to pass the baton to the new administration. So we are now trying to contact uh, Mayor elect uh, uh, Monserrat Caballero to continue working. But I want to say also that we have a uh, constant and continuous and regular meetings within plans, regardless of the administration. So our models and all of our uh, studies consider the information from south of the border. And, and, and uh, yes, con uh, responding to Mr. Uh, 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 we are uh, constantly working with Mexico to make sure we have uh, uh, good collaboration and coordination. Great. Thank you so much. Any additional questions or comments from anyone? Gracias, gracias, Hector. Muy gracias, César. So uh, thanks, everyone. And Jennifer, thanks again. I just want to make sure I'm, LV, I have no, no additional questions or comments from members or the public. 
No, no additional public uh, comments for the record. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer. There's definitely a lot of interest here on international interest. You're attracting a huge international audience and uh, really appreciate it. But also, again, I was just going to say we have a group of very enthusiastic uh, borders committee members as well as uh, our stakeholders, but, you know, who are always have done a great job historically and, and have a great what's their track record of really helping the border work better. The, the real functional, since all of us have like detailed quadrant, meter by meter quadrant knowledge of all the border crossings, because we've all spent so much time in it. I think there's real functional uh, suggestions on how to make things better, right? And what, what, what really how to make the border work better for everybody. So, and how to fit that within the whole framework of, of more better mobility and investment in infrastructure in San Diego. So with that, I will move it on to item number seven. But before that, we are kind of running out of time in terms of getting all the agenda items. So uh, I just want to thank Daniel and Elizabeth have agreed to postpone the item number eight on uh, biking and, and Tijuaneando and BC, which I know a lot of folks are really interested in. Um, but we'd like to focus maybe in the next meeting be a little bit more mobility focused. And hopefully we can invite Marilek Montserrat Caballero uh, as well. So we'll, we'll try to do much more of a mobility focused uh, 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 meeting on, on in July and postpone item number eight. So with that, I would like to introduce Michelle Morris from Design for an Alliance for item number seven to talk about the San Diego Tijuana World Design Capital 2024 submittal. Take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, buenos dias a todos. I am, it is just such an honor to be here today. I'm, I'm joined by my colleague, Carlos Cristiani, who will be, uh, will be tag teaming this presentation. Um, uh, using both Spanish and English. And it's really a privilege for us to be here. Um, I am Michelle Morris. I am the Associate Director of the Design Lab at UC San Diego and also the President of the Design Ford Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that came out of the Design Lab and is really focused on, actually, Jennifer, I loved your presentation, on how do we utilize design to get to the need finding that deep understanding of what constituents want and businesses want and need and how do we then design the future. And uh, we have the privilege of being the, organi the organizing organization um, that is coordinating an amazing binational team, many, many of who are actually on this call. And I see some, some folks who have endorsed this initiative as well. So thank you. And we're trying to be the world design capital of uh, in, in 2024. Um, and not just as one city, but as uh, both San Diego and Tijuana and all that that represents. Um, do we have the slide deck up? Just before we uh, start, Michelle, um, we have to finish by 2.30, and just so you get public comment and, you know, the discussion is the most important thing, maybe no later than uh, than 2.20. I'm not sure how long you're planning on going, but uh, anyway. Got it. No, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, is there a, a screen share? Hold on, I'm looking. I can, I can share my screen as well. Um, Zach, is there a deck? I'm going to plan to... I'm, one minute. Yep, no problem. Well, so uh, while we're waiting for, for the slides to come up, um, so what is the World Design Capital? The World Design Capital is a designation that's given every two years by the World Design Organization. And it's really meant for cities that have, um, have shown that design in all of its forms, whether it's tangible, like architecture, urban planning, um, uh, or you know, digital, visual, all the way through to strategic design, design thinking. How are they usually using design to uh, as a way to um, for social, economic, environmental, cultural growth and development, and and using design in a very intentional, strategic way? So they're looking for best practices that can be then shared with the rest of the cohort. Um, we would be the first U.S. designation on the San Diego side, and we would be we are the first binational bid uh, ever, and we would be the first binational designation as well. And by binational, it's not just San Diego and Tijuana, you know, Tijuana and San Diego, but it's all that we represent. It's the, the cities in San Diego County. It's the, the metropolis of Tijuana. It's the, the floating city that goes back and forth across the border. It's the tribes. So, uh, so make no mistake, it's not just, uh, just about these two cities. And um, let me just ask quickly, Zach, do you want me to share my screen? I'm gonna do that if, if, I, if I have access to. Yes, yeah, uh, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and share your screen. Sorry about that. We don't have the presentation at the moment. 
Oh, no problem at all. Yep, let me, let me pull that up right now. Yep. And, uh, and Carlos, you might wanna say hello as well while I'm just pulling this up quickly. Hi, how are you everyone? Uh, my name is Carlos Cristiani and uh, I was invited uh, recently to join this fantastic effort as the executive director for uh, the World Design Capital uh, San Diego Tijuana bid 2024 for this uh, short list phase. Um, so. Great, thank you, Carlos. And as you can see, this is a, I know several of you have heard this presentation, um, but for those who haven't, this would be, you know, this is a prestigious cohort. It's a very rigorous process. The bid alone was almost 300 pages. Uh, so if nothing else, we have an amazing uh, collection of, of information about our region that we have not had before. The vision for this is that we, you know, we, we want to be more than just a vacation spot or an untold story. I don't have to tell uh, this group just hearing the last two presentations and having worked with Sandig uh, in the past, you know, you do design, you are designing the future and we want to showcase that for the world. But more than that, we want to actually use this um, this uh, this designation as a way to really augment the action taking place and to elevate and um, increase the impact and to truly help transform our region. Um, our theme for this World Design Capital bid is home. And I'm gonna turn it over to Carlos actually to say a little bit about why that is. Carlos? Absolutely, and I'm gonna switch to Spanish. We really want this bid to be absolutely binational, bilingual, bicultural. Uh, como ustedes saben, nuestra región cuenta con una cultura única en el mundo que gravita alrededor del diseño y de la innovación eh, y está definida esta innovación y esta cultura eh, por los obstáculos y retos que vivimos día a día y que vamos resolviendo también a diario de manera conjunta eh, en este cambio constante que, que, que nos da la región por diseño, por la, por la eh, región de la, de la frontera eh, como una barrera este, política, pero además eh, como testamento a la interrelación que hay eh, entre seres humanos, entre personas y entre comunidades. Uh, nuestro lema es eh, la noción de el hogar, uh, that is our, our main theme, the theme of home, y cómo lo creamos. Eh, un hogar, una casa, eh, la generamos nosotros de manera individualmente, todos nosotros, eh, día a día, se construye a diario, eh, y, y en conjunto, utilizando eh, obviamente conceptos de diseño, de innovación, aunque no necesariamente sepamos cuando lo estamos haciendo que los estamos implementando. Um, eh, nuestro hogar, este espacio, the place that we call home, es un lugar que nos da certeza y le da certeza a aquellos que son cercanos a nosotros. Es un lugar que es un santuario y es un lugar común donde innovamos para mejorar nuestra realidad, pero también es un lugar de reconciliación. Eh, eh, le damos la bienvenida a migrantes y a los visitantes que se quedan lejanos o, 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 o de lugares cercanos que llegan a nuestra región de manera tempora, temporal, permanente, o que no, no saben, están, están eh, in flux. Um, este dinamismo y esta apertura es parte de nuestro eh, eh, DNA, de nuestro ADN, como experiencia personal, yo llegué a esta, a esta región hace 20 años a, a través de UCSD y a, me adoptaron San Diego y Tijuana en momentos eh, distintos. Uh, I am a proud San Diegan, I love this city, pero también soy orgullosamente tijuanense. Y estas dos identidades no se excluyen una a la otra, al contrario, eh, me complementan como persona, como ser humano eh, y, y, y definitivamente me han, me han hecho mejor. Um, y bueno, eh, también el, el, hay un, el, el concepto de home en sus siglas tiene también un, un, este, eh, un significado. Eh, la H para Human Centered Design es experiencia humana como el paradigma central de lo que proponemos. La O para eh, la apertura en openness um, y la M para, para, una, eh, para describir una región eh, multi, multicultural y multidisciplinaria. Y la E al final, eh, pues algo que eh, todos, como lo decía al principio, vivimos día a día por tener que resolver estos, estos retos que a diario eh, nos presenta nuestra región. Eh, no nos da miedo eh, experimentar cosas nuevas, eh, poner, eh, poner toda la carne al asador, como decimos en español. Y, y, y regreso a la presentación a Michelle. It goes back to you, Michelle. 
Great. Thanks so much, Carlos. So why design? Uh, design is one of those words. Um, people have very specific idea of what it means. We could tell you, um, I, I, again, this audience, you, all you do is design the future and the now, right? And everything in between. Um, but we could say it's everything and for everyone and everywhere, but that doesn't really get us to action, impact, and transformation. We could also highlight as all the design that's in this region um, on both sides of the border. And, uh, and, and we, have an, we have an amazing talent pool. But actually, just thinking actually what you talked about, Jennifer, um, with the CM, I'm gonna get this wrong, CMCP. Um, you know, where really the value for designers as you're thinking about how we can leverage this, this opportunity for the world design capital for this group uh, and your, your individual constituencies. You know, where design really comes in is gathering, helping gather, helping to do deep need finding and synthesizing. And then, then when it comes to solution finding, helping to design those product services and structures. Uh, we always say, or I should say Neville uh, from Mission Fed says, you know, you either design forward or you live backwards. Um, and so the plan is, there are good, you know, there's this year, we get the designation, it will be 2024. All the work will be done up until 2024 and hopefully beyond. But there are five ways when you think about what is, how does that work break down? There are these world design organization signature events that we have to do. Uh, there's some regional design challenges. <laughs> there are some legacy projects and some community highlights. Just briefly, I think what might be of interest to this group are a couple of things. There's a world policy conference that we, they tell us we have to have these, these events, but we get to determine uh, what that looks like in terms of content and choreography. There's a network of cities meetings where leadership comes in from the other world design capitals and from the world design organization to talk about best practices and to really elevate not just the individual uh, cities and regions, but also uh, you know, the collective cohort globally. Then you know we wanna do things like, you know. Uh, have these 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 highlighted or hallmark regional challenges like how can we really truly create this uh, the pedestrian loop that border fusion has been talking about uh, how are we how can we use this so that we actually have something to show for the work that we're doing or to create the friendship park uh, that Jim Brown and his team have been have been focusing on the, at the border or maybe it's around Balboa Park or maybe it's one of the CMCP um, projects that that you mentioned earlier Jennifer. But you know, we we don't want to create anything new. We simply want to augment or amplify or support what you're already doing. We've identified, based on our our work over the last six plus years, um, the you know ten legacy project areas. And for each of these, we have at least one. In most cases, several partners in the community that are already doing work. And we want to highlight these as being almost our our values and our priorities. And then this is just a few of those uh, organizations that I've mentioned. And then we will have um, just a general call for how do we showcase design, create creativity and innovation uh, to, to basically fill out this year, because we'll have a whole year to celebrate. And while the ceremonial part is actually the smallest part for us, because it's really about the work and the transformation, um, we don't think it's going to be hard to find, uh, you know, given the talent pool to find ways to fill out the space given what's already, this is just what, these are just some of the big things that are already on the docket. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Carlos to talk a little bit about the timeline. Just so you guys know, you, you really have a, a, just a few minutes, like four minutes. Okay. Yeah, we'll try to go as fast as possible. So uh, the timeline, the immediate timeline is going to be in a couple, in about a, a week or so by the end of June. Um, there's an announcement for the short list and who are the finalists are. Um, and then there's a, um, there's a visit that should happen between end of August and beginning of September. Um, it's yet to be determined if it's gonna be in person or virtual. And then the uh, designation award is announced uh, by October, uh, 2021. Carlos, do you wanna to continue this? Yeah, totally, of course. So um, the, um, the numbers are important. And I think uh, the you know, total economic impact that uh, is uh, we can assert can uh, reach the, our region is going to be in the uh, 1.2 billion uh, dollar um, of ec total economic impact. We are also running some numbers for um, Tijuana and Baja in general. So this number is uh, bound to change and probably be increased. Um, and as you can see, this, this, this could be transformational for, for a region just on a numbers base. Of course, this is not only what we talk about, but uh, we are very data driven and we are um, you know, set to put forward um, you know, every single aspect 
of how this is going to um, impact and make our region uh, better. This is just some of the early endorsements. Some of some of you will see your your uh, your yourselves on here. Um, now is the time. Just just quickly, if we don't get the designation, the only thing that goes away is the world design events. We're we're dedicated to this, as is the binational uh, team and uh, all of the supporters so far. We we want to do this in our region. So whether we get this or not, it's happening, um, one way or the other. And so the call to action is really, how can we leverage this opportunity for your goals? Because design is less about adding to and more about integrating with. Um, and then do you wanna close it out in the last 90 seconds, Carlos? Yeah, of course, we can let this opportunity pass. It's been four generations since the World um, Panama Exhibition. And uh, you know the lasting impact that, ha that has left in all our lives, every single district in uh, the entire San Diego region, and as a regional resource, Balboa Park, not only for the San Diego region, but also for Southern California, California itself and Baja. Um, it's something that it's, it's worth putting our bet into, uh, into this event and have, um, you know, in 2040, um, have, um, you know, uh, the community talk about how visionary our leaders were um, to make this and, uh, you know, bring it into fruition. Great. So if you need to reach out to us, please do. Um, uh, Carlos, you can put your uh, your email in the chat as well if you'd like, but we have a general email address. Mine is here. We look forward to working with you and, uh, and helping to transform the region as you all continue to do every day. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michelle and Carlos. Great, pres great presentation. I love the ending, uh, especially just bringing us back to the past and the present with Bobo Park. Um, so that, that's great. And um, Anyway, um, so make sure we have a question from the public or from members, comments. No, we don't have any public comments um, for the record. Are there any member comments? I don't see any member um, or hands raised for um, the members for public record. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Did you say any comments or not, no comments? There's one comment uh, from Miguel Aguirre. Go ahead, Miguel. Yeah, it's hard to speak under pressure here, but uh, thank you, Michelle and, and Carlos. Uh, also, Jennifer, you presented a lot of good information and Vivian as well for your advocacy of San Isidro as a cornerstone in our home region. To me, it, it just seems by default that in joining a, a binational corridor between Baja and points further north, even beyond San Diego, represents high level environmental and economic opportunities for San Diego's place in the world. And also in, in unifying our region and pulling us out of our, you know, as Jennifer pointed out, there are so many corridors, so many projects and silos. How do we all look at the same thing? You know, Baja's affordable housing, urban lifestyle, and a global industries culture with beautiful coastal weather is why so many people are moving south. The, the 2024 initiative uh, of the World Design really captivates how our young people can believe in an effective binational relationship that will contribute to our greater economic security. High level officials too, including Homeland Security, CBP, Commerce of State and State uh, Departments who advocate for North American trade competitiveness, they've got much to gain by supporting and funding improvements for improving our connectivity and cultural integration. So, you know, while some San Diego cities may not want transit expansion in their communities, their children and many young people, uh, our future will likely choose modern high-speed transit and smart ride options over costly uh, auto ownership. Yet, it's gonna be up to, to our collective voice really to think outside our current planning scope. The end of the line is just a start for most. Just look at Tijuana's magnificent high-rise skyline anchored by an amazing medical tourism industry. This is explosive growth, smack on San Diego's border. Becoming uh, an exemplary North American Pacific Rim showcase 
should be embraced wholeheartedly if the Europeans and Chinese can effectively link their regions with high-speed rail, we can also, and we have to paint that vision, we have to create it, we have to uh, allow our, our citizenry to hear those uh, you know, uh, narratives and believe in them. Indeed, the true design planning opportunity at hand in San Diego, Tijuana, is to emerge our binational region by linking the coastal Californias in solidarity. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Look forward to seeing you all in due time. Bye. Thank you, Miguel. Great, great comments. Um, are there additional questions or comments? Michelle or no. Carlos? Oh, um, go ahead, Alvia. No public comments for the record. Okay, great. Michelle, Carlos, any final any final comments or response to that? You're in the mic. No, thank you so much again for this for this uh, opportunity, and we uh, we hope to uh, partner with you in some way, shape, or form moving forward. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And um, you know, I know in Imperial Beach, we've taken a lot from Tijuana and Northern Baja, the whole Baja Rustico, and all the you know the art and use of transforming uh, empty lots and doing just things formally, informally and using shipping containers. Uh, you know, all that we've thrown at IB, it's, it's, it's been such a great thing to steal it from Tijuana and Northern Baja, right? And, uh, you know, as this in Ensenada, you see that same thing, you know, Ensenada has done a great job of trying to be innovative and, and use design, right? Like to, to really uh, fill up the city and make it more attractive and a better place to live. So really interested in helping this this moves forward thank you great well everybody well that's it uh for today uh and uh our next meeting is july 23rd 2021 and it is 2 25 p.m have a great weekend enjoy the beach because it's going to be hot in land as it always is and uh with that we adjourn the meeting thank you so much thank you everybody